And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right. We are talking about the second church, the church at Smyrna after Ephesus. We've commented already on the fact that it's about 35 miles north of Ephesus, and now it's called Izmir, I-Z-M-I-R. Current population of four million, but a whole lot smaller than that at that time. The name means myrrh. And we talked about myrrh and how it's used. Uh, they're being persecuted by pagans, by Jews, and by Satan. And Christ does not criticize them about anything. Now, reading from chapter 2, Revelation 2, verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. We've commented about some of that. Comments that they are rich. 2 Corinthians 6.10 says, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. And of course that's characteristic of us all as Christians. So we're all rich. James 2, 5, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? There's no way to measure the riches of what God has given to us. So it's a comment that they are rich. They, uh, probably the comment is made because they were so impoverished in terms of what you could see now, presently in the world. But of course the statement they are rich could have been made to any of the churches, couldn't it? Christ did not choose to make it, but he did make it here. I, I look at these messages to the churches and to me it seems like we have a tremendous resource. Christ addressed seven different churches and he gave his evaluation of what they're doing. He did not once mention the music program. And there are a lot of other things he did not mention. I think that it is a valuable resource because what we have is a broad, designed comment about the churches by Jesus Christ. Forty years after the time when the comments in Ephesians were made, which is well after the beginning of the churches, and uh, I suggest they're a pretty good guideline for evaluating a church. The things that Christ looked at and commented on in uh, these seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. Looking at the big picture, these saints are rich. They know God. They have a home prepared in heaven. They will enjoy the blessing of God forever. They will enjoy the new earth where everything is better than anything on the earth now. That's pretty special. So we need to focus on our riches, not our lack. Blasphemy. I uh, chose to print out in my notes here, a, directly from a uh, Lexham Bible Dictionary, an article by Donald M. Mills, and just the first part of it. Blasphemy, a verbal insult uttered intentionally and malevolently against God, revealing the offender's contempt for him. Biblical revelance expressed in various forms in the Bible, blasphemy can include flagrant actions and disdain for God's word, his promises, and his people. And when you look at the blasphemy of these people who say they are Jews and are not, you can just sense the fact that what they are doing is criticizing the church. They don't like it that the church has come along and replaced the synagogue. 
and their form of worship and therefore they are arguing against and saying these things are wrong, criticizing them, probably not at all recognizing or realizing that they are blaspheming. But Christ looks at what they're doing and he said this is blasphemy. Pseudo-Jews in the synagogue of Satan blaspheme by mocking Christ's church. The saints assemble in true worship, teach the true doctrine. These are the things that are from God, and those who bought and mock or deny these things are blaspheming. Then the idea of a synagogue of Satan. Uh, at the end of verse 9, those who say they are Jews but are not but are a synagogue of Satan. And then in chapter 3 in verse 9, Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. A couple of phrases in the Old Testament, the Septuagint has translated using the same word, synagogue. In other words, a Hebrew, that's not a Hebrew word, it's a Greek word. But when the Hebrew has been translated into Greek way back then in the Septuagint, the word synagogue was used to translate in two passages. In Numbers chapter 14, I'm not saying these are the only two places this word was used. I'm saying it's used in a way that parallels our concept of synagogue of Satan. In Numbers chapter 14 and verse 27, it says, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? That would be Israel in the wilderness. And evil congregation, the word congregation has been translated by the synagogue, by the Septuagint, as synagogue, this evil synagogue. And then in Psalm 22, 16, for dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers, a synagogue of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You'll recognize that as being a messianic psalm. It's talking about those who surrounded Christ. And uh, they are called a synagogue of evildoers. What is a synagogue? Synagogue is an assembly or a place of assembly. It's the people or the place as used. God describes Israel in the wilderness as an evil synagogue. And in Psalm 22, those who kill Christ is a synagogue of evildoers. Thus, a synagogue of Satan would be a Jewish assembly which serves Satan. They would not say, we serve Satan. They would be very orthodox, probably, in their Judaism. But Judaism has been replaced with Christianity. And they should be following Christ, who has fulfilled the prophecies and the feasts and all the rest of it, instead of doing this. They say they are Jews, but are not. How can that be? Biologically, they are Jewish. They are of the line and lineage of Abraham. But spiritually, they are not Israel because they are not of the faith of Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So to be a Jew, in the sense that it's used here, when Christ says they say they're Jews and they aren't, to be a Jew, you would have to be of the faith of Abraham as well as of the biology, the lineage of Abraham, and these are not. That would be true of many Jews in the world today, would it not? A lot of people who are of the lineage of Abraham, but not of the faith of Abraham, they say they are Jews, and Christ would say, no, you're not Jews. Verse 10, the Christians must stop fearing what they're about to suffer. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. 
Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. We talked about that 10 days last time. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Stop being afraid, but the suffering is going to continue. Now that's an instruction from Christ. Stop being afraid. And by the way, the suffering is going to continue. Can we do that? The answer you're looking for is yes. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There are days when I don't do all that well. But I ought to be able at all times to do exactly what he described. Stop fearing. Why do Christians suffer? There are four reasons in the scriptures why Christians suffer. And I'm about to share them with you. Number one, Christians suffer for discipline. For discipline. 1 Corinthians 11, 30 through 32. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So people get weak and sick as a discipline. What are they doing? They are suffering as a discipline from God. You could also look at Jesus in Hebrews 12, verses 3 and following. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You've not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Down in verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful, peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. One reason that we suffer is for discipline. Reason number two, we suffer to present, prevent us. It's we suffer for prevention, to prevent us from doing something wrong. Second Corinthians 12, 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. He was given suffering as a preventative measure. Sometimes we suffer for discipline. Sometimes we suffer for prevention. A third reason we suffer is for learning or instruction. In Hebrews 5.8, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. You know, when you're God, you don't suffer much. But he became man, and he suffered, and he learned obedience. He, he didn't need to obey, right? Because uh, he, he made the rules, and he liked the rules. But now... As a son, he uh, learns obedience. So, uh, suffering for learning. Again, in Romans 5, 3 through 5, and not only this. Am I going over these texts too fast for you to catch them? Romans 5, 3 through 5. 
And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We exult in our tribulations. Tribulations, I think, can be equated with suffering. And these tribulations are profitable for learning, proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. Oh, and I miss perseverance. Okay, so we suffer for discipline, we suffer for prevention, we suffer for learning, and we suffer to establish a better testimony of Christ. Fourth reason Christians suffer is to establish a better testimony of Christ. Acts 9, 16. For I will show him, Saul, who became Paul, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Why did Saul have to suffer things for Christ's name's sake? You have a better testimony for Jesus Christ. He's going to have to suffer to do that. They're told to be faithful unto death, and Jesus will give them the crown of life. We need to look at what it means to be faithful unto death, and we need to look at what it means uh, when it says a crown of life. The force of this command to be faithful is to keep on doing what they are doing. They are faithful. They need to keep on proving themselves to be faithful. It's the natural course for a Christian to continue faithfully loving and serving Christ until death. Continuing until death is not expressing the length of endurance, but the degree of endurance. Not the length. It's not saying until such a time as you die. It's talking about the degree. Keep on suffering to the very point of death, all the way, the whole nine yards, the degree. Not everyone in this church will be martyred, but everyone should be prepared to die for the faith. Think that applies today? Think Christ is thinking that about us today? We ought to be prepared to the point of death to be faithful? Absolutely. Yeah. The degree of faithfulness. Be faithful until death. Revelation 9.10, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life. There are four different ideas by different students of what the crown of life is. Is it a royal or kingly crown? Is it a festive uh, crown, one given out at feasts, celebrations? Is it a Greek god's crown, one such as the Greek god's war? Or is it, fourthly, a victory garland? A royal crown. But a different word, a different Greek term is used for a royal crown. And the emperor in Rome did not wear a crown. He wore a wreath. So it's unlikely that this being written within the Roman Empire, at the, the edge of Asia, which we call Turkey now, that it was talking about a royal crown. How about a festive crown? The Jews use these at feasts. But John is writing to a Gentile region. And when he writes to them, of course, there's a combination here. It's the words of Jesus Christ addressed to the churches, and John's writing it. But we expect it to be what the people who are hearing it will understand by it. And uh, they probably are not going to think about a Jewish festival there in Turkey, in Asia. So it probably is not talking about a, a festive crown either. 
A third possibility is a Greek god's crown, and their Greek gods would wear a crown. It would be this term, but I can't see Christ and John using a term for a Greek god's crown here. I'm going to give you a crown like the Greek gods wear. I don't think so. That leaves one more possibility, and that's a victory garland. These were awarded to athletic winners. They were, they were competing in the games in order to get a victory garland, the symbol of victory. They didn't get the fancy things we give at the Olympic Games today. We've upgraded, but that's what they would understand. They'd understand the wreath. <coughs> And they were given to athletic winners, and they were given to military generals. And Greek games were referenced several times in the scriptures. I box, not as shadow boxing, and so forth. And Smyrna, the city to which this is written, was famous for its Greek games. So that's what they probably understood by it, a, a victory wreath. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a victory wreath. Okay, what does it signify? The one is, what is it? What are we talking about? And we, I'm suggesting to you that we're talking about a victory wreath. But what is it? And uh, it's a question of whether this is an objective genitive or a subjective genitive. And we don't have to go there. But they're, depending upon what you do with it, uh, a crown of life, and that's expressed by a genitive of, and it can be two kinds of genitive there. And uh, it could be life over and above what all Christians will have. So you be faithful unto death, and I'm going to give you a crown of life. I'm going to give you a crown which is life beyond what other people who didn't die as martyrs get. So for all eternity, you're going to enjoy a better life than the rest of those folks. I don't think so. Because not everybody's had that opportunity. Did I use the right word, opportunity? To die as a martyr for Christ? Well, perhaps. So probably... It's not that there are going to be a few super saints throughout all eternity that are enjoying somehow a, an upper level of life that the rest of us can't attain to. I don't think that's what it means by a crown of life. The other alternative is to understand it as a crown which is life, the eternal life, which we will all enjoy, is the crown which will be given to them. Well, how, I mean, if we're all going to enjoy it, what? What's so special about that? So special about that is that even though you die as a martyr, you are faithful to the very point of death. You die. What are you going to get next? Crown of life. The victory wreath. You've, you've gained the victory. And the crown of life follows, and you enjoy the life for all eternity. And I think that's what it's talking about when it speaks of the crown of life. Unlike other churches, the promise is not linked to Jesus' return. In most of the letters to the churches, the, the, the benefit, the promise at the end is, and when I come back, I'm going to do this for you. Here, it's not tied to that. It's tied to when they die, not to when Christ returns. And it comes from him, he's identified himself to the, to the church at Smyrna as him who was dead and is alive. Again, an encouragement. I've been there, I did that, I died, I came back to life. You're going to die, you're going to come back to life. I'm going to give you the crown of life, the victory wreath of life. Verse 11 he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. The Spirit says this to whom? To the churches. 
This is relevant to all of the churches, not just to the church in Smyrna. It's directed to the church in Smyrna, but if you've got ears, God says you should hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who uh, dies, he, he who overcomes will not hurt, be hurt by the second death. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. He will not be overcome. Uses a double negative. Ume. Two different kinds of no. U is no and me is no. It uses ume. Ninety-four times in the New Testament it uses this double negative. And it's the strongest possible way to express a negative in the Greek language. He will never be hurt by the second death. The second death does hurt all who do not overcome. In Revelation 20 and verse 14 and 21, 8, it identifies the second death with the lake of fire. So the first death, well, we all know what that is, don't we? And then there is a second death, but not everybody experiences the second death. Only those who do not know Jesus Christ experience the second death. And the one who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. That's a pretty good promise. And it relates to our promise of eternal life. And it's specifically directed towards the church at Smyrna. This eternal death is worse than physical death, but it's not annihilation. Some people have the idea that you just, you're gone, you never think again. For some people that would be an upgrade. That would be a whole lot better. But it's not annihilation, it's unending suffering. The promise to the overcomer pays eternal benefits. I like insurance coverage, it helps. I like being able to go to the doctor and the doctor doesn't give me a bill, just sends me on my way. Maybe with a document that says I should go to the laboratory and they're going to test to see how much sugar I've been eating and how much fat I've been eating and all that sort of thing, but they're not going to charge me for it. It's not adding insult to injury, you see. It's just part of the procedure. I, I like that, but those benefits are temporary. They're temporary. And we're talking about an eternal benefit from God. Well, what are the notes about what we have said here? The church at Smyrna is suffering. And it's suffering from pagans persecuting them, from religious but unbelieving Jews who persecute them, and Satan is specifically targeting them. Despite this, they are rich. When people slander the local church, they blaspheme God. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? A religious assembly is sometimes a satanic assembly, even though they do not overtly worship Satan. Okay? The, church, the Jews there, I, I'm confident, I'm absolutely confident that another, none of them ever said, well, we're worshipers of Satan. Not one of them, not ever. And yet Jesus Christ, who is absolutely perfect in his judgment, and he better be because he's judging us all at the end, says that they are a synagogue of Satan. And uh, I expect there are a lot of synagogues of Satan still around, don't you? We like to say that there's some good in every religion, but Jesus Christ doesn't speak of it that way. And what he thinks and what he says is, Definitive. 
We suffer for discipline, for prevention, for learning, and for testimony. We are to be faithful, suffering to the very point of death. The poor can be rich. Jesus offers a victory garland, which is life. The overcomer is absolutely not hurt by the second death. And the message is for all the churches, but especially sent to Smyrna. So that's two of the four churches in chapter two of the book of Revelation. And I'm fortunate in that my notes have run out about the same time as the clock. <laughs> Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us the benefit of your evaluation of the church at Smyrna. And you've told us to hear what you say. Uh, Father, uh, it could come in our time that we would be those that would be called on to go to the very point of death in suffering for you faithfully. And if it does, we sure hope we're going to be found faithful. Strengthen us and help us. Be with us as we go out into the world this week. Help us to bear a true image of the character of Jesus Christ in the church. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.